Good morning and welcome to Elmira Baptist Church's uh, Sunday School lesson for uh, Sunday, December 13th. And Scotty's going to come in a minute and teach us some more about reciprocal living. Let me bring to your attention one birthday, uh, someone who's relatively new to our church, Patty Frazier's birthday is this week. So if you get a chance to wish her a happy birthday. And we've got a birthday coming up next week, but I just want to say this week, I'll say it again next week, Ruth will be 99 this coming Christmas Eve. So if you can get a card in the mail to her and just wish her a happy birthday and thank her, she continues to serve the church, even though uh, the p pandemic has kept her away from services, she's continued to serve the church during this time. So we're looking forward to that day when we can all join together safely in one place again. But Scotty, come now and teach us our lesson. Thank you, Pastor, and welcome to Elmira Baptist Church Sunday School. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here. And if you're watching online, I'm glad you're watching online. I'm happy to be here to be able to record this uh, for Sunday School and share with you another one another command uh, as part of reciprocal living. And I hope that uh, God is using this in your life to help you uh, in obeying these commands and understanding what reciprocal living is and what we should be doing to and for each other in the body of Christ. And it is a blessing to be here and share these commands. As I like to say, if you don't have a handout, please, uh, in Sunday school, look around for one. Somebody has one or they're in the back of the foyer. Uh, and also, if you are at home and don't get one, please contact the church office. We'd like to make arrangements to see if we can get one to you because it will tremendously help your comprehension of what we say. If you don't hear something, you can't raise your hand and tell me. So if you have the handout, most likely it's already on the handout. And I would like for you to be able to have a full understanding of the topics that we share because they're so important. This is such a blessing to me. I uh, first uh, heard it in the 1976 or so, and it's been a blessing to me ever since. I want to share these truths with you so that it might be a blessing to you. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. And it's always a privilege when we can come together and study God's Word. Mm -hmm. So we hope to share some great truths with you this morning, and I pray that this will be a, a great blessing to you. Father, thank you for the privilege of opening your Word and studying your Word. And Lord, we want to look at a topic, confess your sins to one another, which is not the first topic we would pick if we, if we had a choice. But we know this is what you would have us do, and we want to share this with everyone. And it's a positive thing. We kind of think of it as negative, but it's a positive thing. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to sins in our lives, things that disrupt our fellowship, things that cause us not to be fully in harmony and fellowship with our brothers and sisters, Father. We thank you for each one in this church. I pray your great blessing upon each one who listens and each one in Sunday school this morning and each one who listens to the stream live, uh, the, the streaming of this, whether it's live or not. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Help us to honor you in everything we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we are doing confess your sins to one another, which... When I first got it, I thought, oh, I can't do two negatives in a row. And I said, wait a minute, that's a positive. This is a positive. When we obey God, it's a positive. Confess your sins to one another. It doesn't say don't confess your sins to one another. It says confess your sins to one another. So we have in the handout pretty much similar format that we've been doing, an introduction, a command, then, um, a, de a, command, then a definition of that command, then a comment, kind of a clarification, biblical examples, just actually one, so that should be singular, although multiple people did it at the same time, so technically it is plural. Situations calling for a confession, a caution, then principles and application, and then finally the importance. Uh, would like to begin 
uh, before the introduction and just share an anecdote, an illustration, a story from my own family. Perhaps this has happened to you and your family. Uh, my mother had six sisters and two brothers. And the oldest sister and the youngest sister were truly, uh, I loved them and I admired them and I looked up to them, and, but I didn't get to be with them very often because they lived out in Texas and we lived in Tennessee and the travel before the interstate, some of it, <laughs> was not as easy as it is now. Um, and, you know, they were godly women, Christians, they loved the Lord, but as the mother, my grandmother, got older and needed some help as far as living, one of them, the older, decided that she should take her into her home. Now, the youngest daughter, both of these women were tremendous. The older was a, a force to be reckoned with. She took, as the oldest, she kind of took responsibility for the family. She had cared for many of the younger kids and their, si their siblings uh, when they were younger and cooked. And she was a force. She was a cook. She was a, 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 a mighty, <laughs> mighty lady. And the younger one had actually had polio and really struggled uh, to overcome polio. And yet she completely recovered, thankfully. Well, the younger and older really were one, of, they kind of got upset about the details of taking care of the grandmother. And I don't remember what those details were and they really weren't important because, but to them, they got into kind of a dispute. There was some conflict about it. It turned into a dispute, which turned into kind of a disagreement, which pride kicked in and each one knew better than the other. And pride led to anger and it led to actions which created bitterness. Mm -hmm. Then there was alienation. They stopped talking to each other. Sadly, the younger one, of all of the sisters and brothers, the younger one, who appeared to be in the best health, got a melanoma, I think, in her forehead, which is a very dangerous cancer, and it metastasized and spread throughout her body, and she died very quickly. Not speaking to the older um, sister, she died, her wishes, she was buried, they had, they had the funeral, she was buried, and never told the older sister. The husband, some months after, three or four or six months, called and said, listen, I want to tell you, I was required by my wife to do this. This was her wishes, and I'm sorry, but she's dead. She died of cancer six months ago, she, whenever it was, and she, um, we buried her, and uh, I'm, t I'm calling to let you know. The older sister was hurt. It hurt her. So the, the younger sister, if she wanted vengeance, she, she, she won. I, it almost, I could see that younger sister sticking her fist up through the grave saying, I got gotcha. you, I won. But you know, you never win. Yeah. You've gone to the grave yeah. and going to meet the Lord with anger and bitterness and alienation and vengeance in your heart, all those sins unconfessed. And as I think about that, it made me very sad for many years to see that because I was from a perspective, well, I, why would you do that? Whatever is between you, just confess it together and come back in harmony and love and unity. What a terrible example to leave for your children. What a terrible example to leave for families. And it, but I got to thinking, you know, this kind of typifies today's attitudes where people say, I'm right. I'm the one that's right. They're wrong. Why should I be sorry and much less confess? Because it's more important to be right and, and pride kicks in and people think I'm the most important one. And kind of moving into our introduction from that story, which is a negative story, and I'm, I'm sorry about that, but we need to be aware of things that, that can happen. Perhaps one cause, looking at the introduction here, one cause of the lack of spiritual vitality and spiritual victories in the church is our failure to acknowledge our sin to God and to each other in obedience to this command and His command. 
Christians in the church still sin, even though we're saved. We still have the flesh with us. Despite being saved, we sin. And often this sin affects others in the church. Believers may purposely or even unintentionally offend a brother or sister in Christ. Believers, secondly, under B there, believers may do something harmful to the work and witness of the local church. Now, number two, once we know we have offended another brother or sister, or we've offended the church by some particular sin, we have a choice. Mm -hmm. One, or A, under number two, we can cover our sin. We can hide it up. We can, we can put dirt over it, cover it up even continuing to practice it, and then we're increasing the harm. Or, you see a big or there, we can, we, we can acknowledge it through confessing before God and to those we've offended, working to mend those broken relationships and damaged testimonies. How I wish my, my, uh, my aunts had done that. Mm -hmm. My memory of them is tainted by that sinful attitudes towards each other that were needless and not important in the scope of things. Sad, sad, sad. James 5.16, uh, I'm going to read 13 through 16, is where the command is written. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Number 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I do love that verse. That is, Pastor preached on that uh, after he first uh, uh, came here, and what a blessing James was. So what a challenge it was as well. <laughs> well, I want to look at uh, um, I want to look at one set of words, and the first one is sins, and the second one is confess. So in verse 15, where it said. Um, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And you say, okay, Scotty, what are you, what are you, what are you saying? Well, the word sins is uh, the word hamartia, H-A-R-M-A-R-T-I-A, H-A-R-M-A-R-T-I-A. And that word means to sin, it means fault, it means failure, and the, the, the um, literal meaning is missing the mark. And you hear that a lot. Sin can mean missing the mark. And also, it's a, it's a sense of it's a concrete wrongdoing or violation of divine law. What's interesting is the study of sin is actually called hamartiology, H-A-R-M-A-R-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y. Hamartiology might be an I there, okay, A there. Okay, Hamartiology. So uh, the reason I tell you that is because verse 16, the third word, confess your faults, that word is also sins. You notice that confess your sins to one another is the title of the lesson uh, because the word false is sins. And, and that can be that can be translated false. It's not a mistranslation, but it is sins. And we are to confess our sins one to another and pray for one another that we might be healed. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But let's look at the word confess. Now, in English, that word confess means to own up or admit as true. Uh, plead guilty to conf means confess. Now, looking at the Greek, uh, and, and I want to—I know this is not on your handout, so... Um, I want to try to say this as clearly as possible. The root word for sin here is um, H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O. -O -O so H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O. -O -O Homologio is my best guess at how that's pronounced, okay? And the word is from the two words it's made of. 
H-O-M-O -O is to speak the same thing, H-O-M-O-S, really. And then uh, L-E-G-O is, is um, the, I'm sorry, homos is the same, and lego is to speak. Speak the same thing. Mm -hmm. So homos is to, what it's saying is that putting those together, it means to agree with, to assent, uh, accord. And what it's come to mean is to confess, to agree with. So what we're saying is that I agree with God that I have sinned. Uh, it's to speak the same as God about my sin. And what I really like is James uses this word and he puts an EX in front of it. So the actual word here is E-X-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O. -O -O -E and that means a more intensive confession. It's a confess forth, freely, openly. And it's often used of a public acknowledgement of sins. It's a more intensive level of confession, more emphatic. So we are truly agreeing with God that I have sinned in an emphatic manner, saying the same thing as God about my sin, literally. So I love to look at the, the words. That's something I love to do because it helps me remember the passage and also see the flavor and the intention of what the writer of the scripture is trying to put across. Um, and this is a more, in, more intense form of confessing. It's more emphatic. Okay, so let's look at the definition now. The definition is confessing sins to one another. Well, first, I, I put this in three parts because I wanted to make it very easy to see the three segments that we're talking about here. Confessing sins to one another is admitting or acknowledging to other believers the following. Admitting our sin as an outward sign of sorrow for our offense. Confession is admitting our sin and having sorrow for that offense. Number two, it, acknowledging our intent to change. This is repentance, a commitment to, be, to do differently, to change, to repent. And then thirdly, admitting a desire of, for reconciliation or healing, a restoration of love and unity. So you see the three divisions here, admitting our sin and an outward sign of sorrow for our offense, admitting an intent, intent to change, repentance, and acknowledging a desire for reconciliation, which is the goal to bring people back together mm -hmm. through forgiveness and healing. Now, I put a note here, uh, and that is, Confessing sins to one another presumes, essentially assumes, but it's not a substitute for a previous confession to God regarding sins. In other words, I can't just confess to God and then ignore my brother and sister. I can't confess to my brother and sister and ignore God. You, you confess to the Lord first, then you go to the individual. So I want to share with you a story that I found from Harry Ironside um, and he is a, this is an anecdote and he calls it copper nails which I, I, can, I would love to hear him tell this in person when I kept silent my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long Psalm 32 3 which is essentially saying when I failed to repent and kept silent about my sin I, it affected me physically. Uh, he goes on to say, There is nothing so takes the joy out of life like unconfessed sin on the conscience. I once heard the late Dr. F. E. Marsh tell that on one occasion he was preaching this on this question and urging upon his hearers the importance of confession of sin and wherever possible restitution for wrongdoing to others. At the close of the service, a young man, a member of the church, came up to him with a troubled countenance. Pastor, he explained, you have put me in a sad fix. I have wronged another, and I'm ashamed to confess it or try to put it right. You see, I'm a boat builder, and the man I work for is an infidel. I have talked to him often about his need of Christ and urged him to come hear you preach. But he scoffs and ridicules it all. Now, 
I have been guilty of something that, if I should acknowledge it to him, will ruin my testimony forever. He then went on to say that some time ago he started to build a boat for himself in his own yard. In his work, copper nails are used because they do not rust in the water. Mm -hmm. These nails are quite expensive, and the young man had been carrying home quantities of them to use on the job. He knew it was stealing, but he tried to salve his conscience by telling himself that the master had so many he would never miss them, and besides, he was not being paid all that he thought he deserved. But this servant had brought him to face the fact he was just a common thief. Mm -hmm. For those uh, for whose dishonest actions there was no excuse. But, he said, I cannot go to my boss and tell him what I've done and offer to pay for those I've used and return the rest. If I do, he will think I'm just a hypocrite. And yet those copper nails are digging into my conscience, and I know I shall never have peace until I put this matter right. For weeks the struggle went on. Then one night he came to Dr. Marsh and exclaimed, Pastor, I've settled for the copper nails and my conscience is relieved at last. Well, the pastor said, well, what happened when you confessed to your employer what you had done? Oh, he answered, he looked, my boss looked strangely at me and then exclaimed, George, I always did think you were just a hypocrite, but now I begin to feel there's something in this Christianity after all. Any religion that would make a person that was a dishonest workman come back and confess that he had been stealing copper nails and offer to settle for them must be worth having. Mm -hmm. Dr. Marsh asked if he could use the story and he was granted permission. Sometimes afterward he told it in another city. The next day a lady came up and said, Doctor, I've had copper nails on my conscience too. And he said, Dr. Marsh said, Why surely you're not a boat builder. No, but I'm a book lover and I've stolen a number of books from a friend of mine who gets far more than I could ever afford. I decided last night I must get rid of the, quote, copper nails. So I took them all back, the books, back to her today and confessed my sin. I can't tell you how relieved I am. She forgave me and God has forgiven me. I'm so thankful for the copper nails that are not digging into my conscience anymore. Uh, and then... He says, I have told this story many times, and almost invariably people have come up to me afterwards telling of, quote, copper nails in one form or another that they had to get rid of. On one occasion, I told it at a high school chapel service. The next day, the principal saw me and said, as a result of that copper nail story, ever so many f stolen fountain pens and other things have been returned to their rightful owners. Um, Moody says, uh, or rather Iron says, said, Reformation and restitution do not save. But where one is truly repentant and has come to God in sincere confession, he will want the best of his ability, he will want to the best of his ability to put things right with others. That's Ironside from Illustrations of Bible Truth, uh, 1945. Um, so let's move over to the second page and we will uh, continue by talking uh, doing the comment section I want to clarify this passage here I thought there was enough issues here that that we needed to kind of do a clarification so number one James does not say that we should confess to a priest or any other uh, position in the church uh, for salvation or as a sacrament that is a means of grace. Uh, there's one major church that teaches that you are saved by all of your life experiences, everything from baptism to the last rites, masses in between, and those are all dispensers of grace. We know the Holy Spirit is a dispenser of grace. God is a dispenser of grace and not sacraments. Uh, we have two ordinances that we we, cel we celebrate, and that those are symbolic, and the Lord's Supper and baptism. This passage concerns mutual confession, unlike that which Roman Catholicism practices and teaches. Number two, James does say that we should confess to each other and pray for each other. Uh, number three, James does connect sin and illness, but he doesn't connect the dots so we see that where it all comes together. 
Now we know all illness is due to sin. Uh, when our natures became sinful and sin entered into the world, Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. They were kicked out of the, they were, they were left to leave the Garden of Eden. I started to say kicked out, I guess they were, uh, as part of their punishment. <laughs> and they, sin came upon the world and also disease and illness. And we know that we are sinners by, <clears throat> excuse me, by nature and by practice. We have Adam's nature in us. And um, what we need is the second Adam, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So illness is due to sin in general, yes. But there are some people that try to um, make it more specific. And we'll talk about that when we get to number five. Number four, James indicates that the purpose of confession and praying is healing. Um, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, verse 15 out of chapter 5. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So the, the, the purpose of confession is healing. Confession and praying is healing. Spiritual and physical healing. Okay, number five. I felt compelled to mention this because some people say that you are ill because of a specific sin. Now we are ill because of sin, <clears throat> but you can't point at someone, you can't point at Scotty and say, Scotty, you're ill and you have this disease because of this sin. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that. We are not God. We don't know what God's purposes are. Mm -hmm. We know what he has revealed to us. Now, an individual themselves may come to the conclusion that they are ill due to sin, perhaps due to their own choices, their own activities or actions or bad choices, disobedience and other issues, and ask for healing, prayer for healing, and uh, confess their sin. That is them saying that, not you. We are not to look at others and make that decision. God knows his purposes, but the individual can interpret that and certainly has the right to do that. Now, <clears throat> if we think about sin and illness, if I were to drink too much alcohol, I could give myself cirrhosis of the liver. I, if I smoked, I could give myself cancer. If I drove a car recklessly, and had an accident, I could injure myself and I have an illness or an injury and sickness. Um, if God also allows chastisement to come upon us for our own good. Sickness, God, we know from scripture that God allows things to come into our lives, sometimes illness, it gets our attention because you're flat on the back. The only way you could look is up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so God allows chastisement for good to come into our lives to help us to bring, bring us back to him and to also um, for his own purposes. Paul actually had an infirmity in the flesh. He calls it a thorn that was given to him. And that's in uh, 2 Corinthians 12. And we're going to read verses 7 through 10. We're not going to spend a long time here, but I just want to share a couple of things that, that come out from that. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, Paul speaking, and he said, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, and it, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength, for, thy, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, Paul's saying, then I'm as strong because God has complete control. And Paul is saying, I just get in the way. 
<laughs> when, when, when I'm strong, it's Paul. But when I'm weak, it's all God. Mm -hmm. And this is a wonderful verse. This is probably my life verse. My grace is sufficient. God says, my grace is enough. It's sufficient. It's more than enough for you. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, I got the Lord by this thorn in the flesh. Most people think it was an illness or a disability of some kind. It reinforced Paul's humility, which, which he said was a good thing because he could have been elevated way above his... his uh, above measure because of all the revelations. Remember, he wrote most of the New Testament. So he was truly taught by the Lord so many things that, um, that were mighty and powerful. So, so it really it reinforced humility in him. Also, it kept him from presumption in prayer. He prayed three times for that to be answered. And the answer was, this is, this is for your good. Now, <clears throat> we don't like to think like that. We think our hearts are kind of tender, and we think, oh, man, it would be a lot better if you're well. But God knows what's best for us. Now, I know that's hard for us to accept, but his grace is sufficient for us. And thirdly, it does demonstrate the sufficiency of God's grace. One, humility, it keeps him humble. It, keeps, it kept him from pres pres presuming in prayer. And number three, it demonstrates the sufficiency of God's grace. And that is almost an inexhaustible subject, the sufficiency of God's grace. God will meet our needs in ways that we will never understand or expect in such a powerful way. And that is a mighty... I, I encourage you to reflect on this verse. This is such a wonderful verse. Um, we want to look, though, and move on to the biblical examples in Acts 19, 18 through 20. In the, in the first century, uh, people got saved in the church. And verse 18, we read Acts 19, 18 through 20. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts. Now, that was... Uh, satanic demonic activity they brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver now that was a lot of money back then it's a lot of money today but look what happened what was the result so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed what a tremendous blessing from confession to blessing I love that and that, you see that many times where people repented of their sins and got right with God. There was blessing. And when people are in, I can't, can you imagine what, have hap what would have happened if my aunts had confessed their sins and went to, she went, the lady, my youngest aunt, went to her grave in harmony and, and unity and love with my sister. What a blessing that would have been for both of them and the rest of the family. What a tragedy when people harbor sin in their lives and it disrupts fellowship and it disrupts the mission and the ministry of the yeah. church. So um, blessing often comes from confession. Okay, uh, looking at situations that call for confession. A believer should confess to others when? We're in the middle of page two. Um, he offends a brother or sister in Christ. Matthew 5.23 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught or something against thee, then leave thy gift there before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. God doesn't want our worship and there's strong indication that he won't accept it if we have sin in our heart and broken fellowship with other believers. Unresolved sin and unresolved issues are really a big part of the challenge in the modern church. We harbor sin. We've covered it up. We've, we're trying to do away with it. We're trying to salve our consciences like the, 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 uh, the copper nail story. And we're trying to hide it. God wants us to confess that and move on. Now, 
I have uh, a story by Moody. Uh, he wrote, a lady in the north of England said, every time she got down before God to pray, images of what she had stolen came up before her mind. Mm. I'm, I'm smiling because her conscience is working. She had taken them wrongfully one time when she was a housekeeper and had not been able to pray since. She felt God advised her to make restitution. But the person is dead, she thought. I didn't have to go say I'm sorry to a dead person, you know. And, and uh, then she felt the Lord was saying to her, aren't some of the heirs living? And she goes, oh, Lord. Well, yeah, there's a son. And then she felt the Lord was saying, well, go to that son and pay him back. Mm -hmm. Well, she said, I want to see the face of God, but I couldn't, think, I couldn't think of doing a thing like that. My reputation is at stake. P R I D E. Mm -hmm. She went away and came back the next day to ask the Lord, wouldn't do just as well to put the money in the offering plate? <laughs> she's, she's got them all the ankles. She called it in the treasury of the Lord. No, uh, she felt the Lord was telling her, God doesn't want any stolen money, <laughs> which was a good answer. The only thing is to make restitution. She carried that burden for several days, but finally went into the country, m looked up that son, saw him, made a full confession and offered him a five pound note. Uh, he said he didn't want the money, but she finally persuaded him to take it and came back with a joy and peace that made her face radiant. She became a magnificent worker for souls. Now listen to this. Confession to blessing. Listen to this. She became a magnificent worker for souls and led many into the light of knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here Moody says, My dear friends, get these stumbling stones out of the way. God yes. doesn't want a man to shout hallelujah who doesn't pay his debts. Yes. Many of our prayer meetings are killed by men trying to pray who cannot pray because their lives are not right. Sin builds up a great wall between us and God. Any man or a man can may stand high in the community and may be a member of some church in good standing. But the question is, how does he stand in the sight of God? If there's anything wrong in your life, make it right. And that's what the Lord is saying in this command. Confess your sins to each other and to the church if needed. Now, Moody, that's powerful. I thought that was powerful. And looking at number two under situations calling for confession, if you've been admonished by the church leadership to go and uh, confess to a, a person. And this is what church leadership would usually tell you in Matthew 18, 15 through 18. This is a blueprint for reconciliation. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That's restitution of uh, uh, reconciliation. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. A blueprint there for reconciliation that uh, leadership would tell you if you went to them to consult them about uh, confessing or sharing a fault, uh, a perceived wrong or a trespass with one another. Now, if you've sinned publicly, generally commission of a sin that's public will uh, and negatively affects the church requires a public uh, uh, um, or, the, or the church's public testimony will require confessing to the public, uh, to, the, to the church at large, excuse me. So looking at Ephesians 2 through 7 there, uh, have 2 through 8, but verse 7 is all we're going to read. With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But every one of us is given 
uh, and, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of gift of Christ. We are to endeavor to keep the unity of the faith and often that would require confession to reconcile sin between believers or sin in the church. Now, I have an illustration that I'm sad to say is true, but it has a good ending. A friend of ours, um, my wife and I, um, who was like a Peter. This guy would take the bit in his mouth and he would go for it and he, he was a doer. He was, he, was a, he was a hard charger. He loved the Lord. He loved the Lord fervently. He reminded me so much of Peter. Um, sometimes his mouth went before his mind, but that, you know, he, I, I really admire his doing. Went us door to door with him many times telling people about Christ. Well, it came, came, a, part, came a time in our church, when we were moving from a, um, a bit where we didn't have a building and just meeting in a place we rented and all this work of taking things down and setting things up after every service, the nursery, the kitchen, everything, all the chairs, all of it had to be done, cleaned up afterwards. It was a major effort. And we went to a building and got a building through a real creative method and long story. But, uh, and the pastor was an attorney, so he was very smart. And... Our friend, who was a wonderful man, a father, husband of a wonderful wife, couldn't understand something that the pastor did and felt it was unethical and wrong. And rather than approach that issue sensitively, got vocal and left the church. And I don't remember what it was, but it was it was legal, it was ethical, it was moral, and it was not anti-biblical. And while it was tried, to, they tried to explain it to him. He just left in kind of a huff. And three to six months later, I don't remember how long it was. He came back and saw the pastor and said, "Pastor, I have sinned against you. This was wrong." I shouldn't have done this. I hope you can forgive me. I would like to come back, but if you don't want me to come back, I can understand. Pastor said, oh, no, please come back. We'd love to have you. We, thank you for coming back. And he said, I've confessed this sin to God, the, the, our friend. And he said, I want to confess this to the congregation because I did not do this quietly. I, I said some things before I left. He said, okay. And he got up and he said, this happened. I was wrong and I'm sorry, and the pastor was right, and I was wrong, and I want to move forward, and we're going to not let Satan have the better of us, and we're going to serve the Lord. And I want to tell you, this guy became a dynamo for the Lord. He was the hardest working guy in the congregation, was not a deacon. He was, not, he was, a, he, he was a leader by default, uh, an informal leader. He loved the Lord. He served the Lord. He won people to Christ, and he was a blessing for many years until he moved out of the state. And I'm sorry he's gone because I really admired somebody that could say I was wrong, yeah. and that and 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 I was wrong because I sinned, and it wasn't just a matter of discussion, but I sinned against you, and I'm wrong. And then he confessed that in public to everyone, and that showed everyone as a, as a model of what they should be doing to reconcile sin. And he confessed that publicly because it neg negatively affected the peace and unity of the congregation. And uh, I really admire, really admire him. So uh, he continued to serve the Lord for as far as I know, he's still serving the Lord, moved out of state. Now, number four, uh, if you should confess to another if you want to, if you desire accountability from a trusted friend. Now, this is not commanded anywhere in Scripture. Now, there are certain things that would indicate it's a great idea, like there's much wisdom in many counsel. As long as you don't have friends like Job, uh, you'd be good. But he, he, if you have a besetting sin or something that you're working on and you want accountability, it is great to find a trusted friend that's mature that can be a help to you and... Uh, Trust them to help you as you're accountable to them to overcome the sin. So let's move to the caution now. Now, it's important to realize confessing to one another is not these things. It's not a got license for gossip. This is not a time to start sharing things um, that are, should be confidential because they can 
um, they can harm others. It's not intended as an opportunity to confess every sin to anyone and everyone you know. That's going overboard. It's too much. It's not a means to overburden your brother or sister. That's overwhelming. Uh, don't make it a stumbling block to your brother or sister and possibly cause them to fall into temptation. So be careful um, if you're talking to people uh, with open confession. Make sure that you're wise about how you do that. Let's move over to the top of page three, principles and applications. Confessing sins to one another is a vital part of the process of spiritual restoration and becoming more like Christ, conforming our engine, Im image to Christ. Uh, it's a catalyst for growth. Number two, believers should examine their lives and relationships with others in light of Scripture to see if they're guilty of any offense which requires confession. 2 Corinthians uh, 13 5 says examine yourselves whether you be in the faith prove or test your own selves not Christ yourself mm -hmm. know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate I think that means not of the faith or unless you fail the test <laughs> so we are to examine ourselves to make sure that we are we have no offense left un unreconciled that requires confession. Number three, confession of a particular sin means readiness to forsake that sin, number one, readiness to do all that's necessary to restore the any broken relationships, two, and a desire for help and cooperation of others. Those three things. Confession of sin is not the mark of a weakness, number four, but of spiritual maturity because the believer is being obedient to the command of God and obediently is bringing their life into conformity with the Word of God. It's a sign of obedience. God blesses that. That's why there's blessing after confession. Now, uh, Augustine said, the confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. In other words, confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. So, uh, five, a believer to whom a brother or sister confesses is obligated, number one, to pray for, and number two, to forgive that event, offender. Luke 17, 4 says, And if you trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Thou shalt forgive him. Now, I asked my mom when I was a young man, Mom, what if they do it eight times? She said, <laughs> She said, Scotty, that's metaphorically speaking. It means as often as they ask forgiveness, you give it, give it to them. And I said, oh, okay, okay. I knew that. I don't know why I was looking for escape. So what's the importance of this command? Reading from the handout. The importance to this command to confess our sins to one another is valuable because it is essential in restoring relationships between believers which have been damaged by offensive behaviors or attitudes. Believers are to make every effort to avoid sinning against and offending their fellow believers in any way. When believers do offend one another, they are to seek reconciliation through confession of their sins. Through obedience to the command, the sinning brother is one, restored, uh, the peace of the church is assured, and number three, a good witness and testimony to the world is maintained. Mutual confession of sins allows believers to build up one another more effectively and pray intelligently. Mm -hmm. And I have a quote by somebody you know. Confessions of sins to one another may be considered the spiritual antibiotic of the church. The Holy Spirit uses it to promote love, heal our wounds, restore our relationships, and increase the vitality of the church. It provides the means of healing and making us well. Um, it's the vehicle that does that. We know God does that. Spiritual antibiotic. That's my quote. Okay. <laughs> so our time is up. I pray that the Lord would uh, bless our relationships and help us to confess our sins to one another when appropriate and that he would watch over us in love. And thank you all for uh, tuning in and, and uh, are coming to Sunday school. Let's pray. Father. 
We thank you for this command that you have given us for our own good. I pray that you would help us to obey that command willingly and cheerfully and lovingly. I pray that you would bless our church, that our church would be a place where the fellowship is strong, where it's loving and mighty. This be a place that people know loves God because of the, our deeds and how we serve one another and care for one another. I pray that you would bless everyone that has heard this, that you would drive it home in our hearts as a truth that we would live by. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.